Welcome everyone. I'm glad you're here. For anyone who doesn't know me, I am Eric White. I'm the adult services librarian here at the library. Um, yeah, welcome to our, what is it now, like fourth or fifth program of, of One Book, One Valley uh, for the fifth speaker. Um, so just a little bit about One Book, One Valley. Every year since 2011, the Estes Valley has celebrated community and literacy by coming together to be in conversation around a single book. This year, it's Finders Keepers by Craig Childs. I'm honored to be introducing the next installment of our exploration of the book and the issues around it. We'll have great programs on these topics throughout the month. You can find more on our website, estesvalleylibrary.org. And of course, we will culminate with an in-person visit from Craig Childs himself. That'll be Monday, February 6th at 6 p.m. at the Presbyterian Community Church of the Rockies and also on Zoom. Um, so before I introduce our guest, uh, a few quick words about tonight's program. We will be recording it in its entirety and posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, so for the in-person audience, um, if you ask a question, your voice will likely be in the recording. Um, but your image uh, will likely not be. Um, <laughs> I can't make any guarantees with the Owl camera, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, and for our online audience, I will be taking questions through the chat and relaying them on to Tom. Um, so yeah, feel free to submit questions at any time during the program. Uh, so yeah, now I'd like to introduce our guest. Tom Westfall is a writer, parent educator, human services consultant, an avocational archaeologist who lives on the South Platte River in Logan County, Colorado. He has written seven artifact-related books for collectors. He is an associate editor of Prehistoric America magazine. He works extensively with the professional art archaeological community in both site excavation and exploration. And along with his wife, Myra, Tom has purchased a lithium casting company and for the past eight years, he and his wife have made resin casts of stone artifacts, primarily for universities, collectors, and museums. Please welcome Tom Westfall. Thanks, Eric. It's good to be here with you this evening. I appreciate the opportunity. I think the opportunity here is wonderful. Um, I'm really impressed with the fact that you have this One Book, One Valley program, and I'm honored to be a part of it. So. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you tonight from a collector perspective. You know, if you think about artifacts, there's a continuum. There are there are people who uh, collect artifacts on this end who are responsible, and on the other end of that continuum, we have pot hunters. And obviously, most of us eschew pot hunters. So I'm going to kind of talk to you about responsible collecting tonight. I'm going to talk to you about why my family and I love it what it means to us. I'm going to talk about some of the artifacts that we have, have collected. Um, certainly when uh, Craig uh, comes and talks with you, he's going to talk with you about the fact that we've got plenty of stuff to study. We just need to leave it in the ground. You know, he's a wonderful writer and I love the man. I've read everything that he's written. I just don't agree with his premise. But, but <laughs> that being said, you know, he, he, you're going to have a wonderful time with him. He's a great speaker, wonderful writer. So, let me start by just kind of talking about my humble journey as an artifact hunter. I found my first arrowhead when I was five years old. Now, I lived in southern Indiana. My dad was a student pastor at a Presbyterian church. And back in the day, this was in the 50s, you know, so <laughs> back in the day, kids didn't have a lot of money. Families didn't have a lot of money. And one night after uh, school, we rode the school bus out to my friend's house for his birthday party. There were about 10 of us boys. And we went inside and his mom gave us some Kool-Aid and I think we had some crackers uh, with some of that cheese whiz that they used to make. And then she said, well, uh, we're gonna have cake after a while. Why don't you boys go outside and play? And it's like, okay. So we all decided to run out and play. And <clears throat> Danny Malone, young man's name said, you know what, instead of just playing football, why don't we walk over here into my field? And he said, each of you can find one arrowhead. There's an, there's an Indian field here. I was like, you know, whatever. So we walked out there and like in five minutes, I found a, a great big spear point. And from that moment on, I was like, oh, 
well, that was pretty fun. Shortly thereafter, we moved to Colorado. And uh, my spear point was my treasure, and I had it on my dresser. And my next door neighbor came over, we were going to play football, because I didn't know anything about arrowheads in Colorado. And he came up to my room with me to grab my football, and he looked on my dresser, and he said, oh, you like arrowheads? I know where we can find some of those. I was like, yeah, yeah, no, they're all, they were all picked out. My uncle was a collector back in Ohio. He told me you couldn't find any anymore. I was like, well, I guarantee you we can, we can find some. So the next night after school, and you have to understand that <clears throat> I was willing to be a nerd. I took my canteen to school <laughs> over my shoulder. And of course, the kids are like, oh, you got your canteen? Are you thirsty today? It was before water bottles were very famous, right? And, and the kid with the canteen was somewhat different. So anyway, that night after school, we walked three miles out in the country. And I remember distinctly thinking, well, why would there be arrowheads here? It was a wheat field. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe I was expecting something like remnants of an old village. I mean, something that was distinguishable from the agriculture that surrounded the area. And I said to my friend, I said, well, we're not going to find any arrowheads in a wheat field. He said, you see that little light spot up there on the side of the hill? We call that a blowout. And what that means is the sand has blown out. And he said, there's a habitation site up there. And when you walk up there, you're going to start finding little chips and you might even find an arrowhead. And I was like, okay, well, we've walked three miles. We might as well walk the 200 yards to the top, right? So I trudged up to the top of the hill and it was like heavens opened up, the light shone down and right there in front of me was a sparkling point. I couldn't have missed it if I would have tried. I saw it from 20 feet away. It's a tiny little point, what we would call a late corner notch point, maybe 500, 800 years old, not very old, not very significant, but it changed the arc of my life. Okay, From that moment on, I was an artifact enthusiast. And every night after school, I would ride my bicycle out. Again, my father was a pastor, so all the people in his church would, oh yeah, no, I've got some eroded fields. You ought to come out and hunt our house. And so we would do that, and pretty soon my dad got interested in it. He realized that it was going to be a way of keeping up with me <laughs> rather than losing me to his teenage years. And uh, so we, we became hunting buddies. And one of the things I'll say is that, you know, my father was a strict German, right? And for those of you that, that know strict Germans, the Germans were the first people that ended up with a parenting theory. They called it German pedagogy. And the theory of German pedagogy was you broke the will of the child and then you reconstructed them in your own image. Well, that was a little bit the way that I was raised with the exception of when we hunted arrowheads because it was the most egalitarian equal thing because it didn't matter whether you were the dad or you were the boy. In fact, I was a little closer to the ground than he was. And it was the only time we were truly equal. And so anytime I could get him out on the field, that was, <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty big deal. So that, you know, that kind of began my, my journey in Colorado. Then I went to school out in Sterling, Kansas, and uh, spent most of my time hunting artifacts on the field near the campus. Um, probably much to the chagrin of my professors who wished I would spend more time studying, but I amassed a nice collection of artifacts from, from this site in Kansas. And then I went to graduate school in St. Louis and Found a lot of artifacts uh, in St. Louis uh, as well. That was fun. One of my favorite finds of all times. I was I, my first wife and I. She died when my kids were little. Uh, she loved to go watch the planes land, and so we were sitting there watching the planes. There's a landing area, and they had they had taken a little disc and disc a little edge uh, to kill the weeds. And so we were, I, you know, she said, "Let's go sit on that little post." And I walked out to the little post, and there was. <laughs> Perfect arrowhead laying there on the ground at the St. Louis airport. Uh, and it's like, you know, they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. And it's one of the things that, you know, when I talk to professional archaeologists, that sometimes they fail to recognize literally there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of artifacts still in the ground. In fact, I would estimate that probably 90% of uh, what was ever made is still in the ground. And that's a, that's a pretty significant amount. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's, it is a finite resource, but not, not be, <laughs> I was thinking about the dinosaurs, how long did they last, 60 million years? This, I think, will probably last at least that long, <laughs> provided we don't have another meteorite. Um, so, 
as I, as I began collecting, one of the things about young collectors, I don't know if any of you are hunters in here, but if you're a hunter, and I'm talking about big game now or, or birds in general, if you're a hunter, when you first start out, it's the motto is if it flies, it dies, <laughs> okay? I mean, you just want to, you just want to shoot anything. Um, well, the same thing is kind of true of beginning artifact hunters. You just want to see how many you can find. You know, you're not thinking about the archaeology of it. You're not thinking about anything other than just finding them. And in fact, you know, the first few years that I hunted, all I cared about was perfect arrowheads. I didn't understand the value of, of broken arrowheads. I kept them because that's pretty much what, everything that I was finding. But, you know, the, the archaeology of it kind of eluded me. And then I learned about Folsom Points. Now, for those of you, how many of you have heard the term Folsom Point? Okay, well, until 1923, archaeologists worldwide thought that people had only been in the New World about three to 4,000 years. Okay, so in about 1896, there was a big flood down at, down at Folsom, New Mexico, and a black cowboy by the name of George McJunkin was riding out through an arroyo, and he found these huge, huge bison bones. And they weren't buffalo. They were the bison antiquus, which we all knew had been extinct about 10,000 years. And he found a couple of fluted points with it. He didn't know what, what they were. He talked to a couple of people, but it took till 1923 before anybody began any serious archaeological ex exploration of this site. So they began to find in these, in these, in these bison bones, these projectile points. And if I can show you, <clears throat> these two right here are casts. Um, this one, if you, how many of you have been to the Denver Museum and seen their display? The Denver Museum has this, this point with the bison bones that it was laying in. Steve Nash, the director of archeology span there uh, allowed us to cast this. And we now sell this to mostly universities who want to be able to have this to explain to their students. When this was found, it was laying between the ribs of a 10,500 year old extinct bison. When that happened, oh my gosh, work stopped immediately. They sent cables, you know, they didn't have email, they didn't have texting. They sent cables all over the world and archeologists came from all over the world to see this in what we call in situ, mean laying there with these bones, because it was the first time that they were able to prove that people had been in the world, new world, more than about 4,000 years. So this is perhaps the most exciting discovery that, that really occurred. And you think about that, 1923, that's only 100 years ago. And the advancement in archeology span has happened. Well, when I started reading about Folsom points, I got really excited because it's like, well, got to have one of those. So I went to the Denver Museum on my eighth grade field trip. Of course, I'd never found a Folsom point at that point in time. And they had this display right out in the, right out in the main mezzanine there. And I went over and I was looking at it. There was a glass and I had my nose pressed down against it. I felt this tap on my shoulder. I looked around and there was this stern, taciturn woman. She said, young man, do you know what you're looking at? And I said, well, I think it's a Folsom point. Oh, you know about Folsom points. I said, well, my friend Burt Mountain, he was a famous collector in Eastern Colorado. Oh, you know Burt Mountain? I said, yes, I do. She said, well, I'm Dr. Marie Wormington. <laughs> she was the head of the uh, Museum of Archaeology at that point in time. And so she and I, the rest of the kids went and looked at the dinosaurs. She and I spent the next 10 minutes talking about Folsom points. And she assured me that I wasn't going to find one in my lifetime, that they had all been picked up. I was needless to say devastated, <laughs> but I also wasn't quite sure that I believed her because you know it's like there's a whole bunch of ground out there in eastern Colorado that's never been turned over. Surely there's got to be a few more. So it was at that point in time that I really became interested in more of the science of it. And the second phase, you know, the first phase is kind of you know you want to just find as many as you can, and then you want to get selective. And pretty soon you want to find out about the science of it. And so for me, <clears throat> this evolution occurred, you know, as I was as I was getting into my high school years, it was a, a way of you know learning about how long people had been in the new world. Now, it's interesting. 
some of you I was talking to before the show, uh, before the presentation, we were talking about Clovis. And Clovis is the oldest known type of point in North America. And they're between 12 and 15,000 years old, okay? I work on a site with the University of Wyoming up at Douglas, Wyoming, and we have a site there that is producing 12,900 BP, which you have to add about 2,000 years, so about 14,500 year old points. Clovis points, and I'm going to I'm going to point out just a, a couple things. And the other thing I'm going to point out is that were it not for collectors, some of this information would have been lost. Okay, you know, um, this is this is a the this is actually really the first Clovis point that was identified. It was found at Dent, Colorado, on the South Platte River. The Clovis point should be called the Dent point. <laughs> But darn it, when, when the, the man that was doing it was the professor at Regis University, and he was a Jesuit, and he got delayed, I think probably because of religious things, and he didn't get out to the site to finish it, and they discovered at Clovis, New Mexico, all these mammoth remains with these Clovis points intact, and so Clovis got the name. This is a cast, of course. Uh, you know, we've done this one for a number of different universities. But this is a Clovis point again. Clovis, if you think about if you think about time, Clovis people have been in North America, you know, well, probably fifteen thousand years. Now, some of you ask, well, is that the oldest? It really isn't necessarily the oldest. We don't know what the oldest is because this is the first type point. There were probably things older. So speculation. Let's say that you were in a small boat, because we know that they had boats for many, many, many years. You're a small boat off the, uh, off to the Sea of Japan, and you get into a windstorm, okay? And that windstorm blows you down, and you end up off the coast of California after treacherously surviving in the sea, and there's five of you there, um, and you all happen to be men, <laughs> okay? There's no one in the new world, right? So you're there until the last of you dies. But in the meantime, you may have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years of creating technology, of making artifacts, of surviving. And so some of the some of the sites that they're now discovering may have been sites that people discovered uh, or that people inhabited prior to Clovis, but their migration became extinct. Now, can I prove that? Of course not. You know, that's but that's a theory. And it's a theory, and it's one that you know, as as we start pushing the envelope back, for a long time it was Clovis first, Clovis first, Clovis first. That was the that was the mantra. Now we know that there are a number of sites in North America that are older than Clovis. They don't have a distinctive point type, so it's hard for us to be able to recognize. Oh, that's a pre-Clovis point. That's a because each site has something that looks a little bit different, and so it's not quite the same. So the my journey then took me to uh, college and i was going to study archaeology um <laughs> that's what i really wanted to do but my dad being a minister said being a german <laughs> you probably need to go to a presbyterian school and apparently presbyterians didn't offer archaeology fortunately i found a professor that loved archaeology and he and i did a lot individually <laughs> but i never really had any classes in it and then when i went to graduate school i majored in history. Um, but I think that that the important thing is for us to recognize that collectors play an important role in the study of archaeology. Okay. Again, I've taken a number of archaeology classes. I work with a number of professional archaeologists. I've learned from all of them. Um, we have several online this evening. Hi, Scott. Uh, nice to have you online. <laughs> He's an archaeologist in Texas. Um, many of the discoveries that have been made that have led to scientific exploration have been done by amateurs. You know, archaeologists are studying in their labs. It is collectors who are out in the field. It is farmers who are out in the field. Um, this, this particular point here, this is another cast. This was found about five miles south of Sterling. It's a Clovis point. Interestingly, with this point, there were five hematite beads. Those beads are the oldest known beads in North America. We're in the process of casting them. By the way, this is my wife, Myra, over here on the, raise your hand, Myra. 
she's the she's the cast master. Uh, I do not have the patience or the artistic talent to be able to do it. She's she's amazing. Um, but this point was lost in time. You know, there was a, in 1999, uh, two famous archaeologists came out and, and recorded the site, but they weren't able to get a hold of the point. And in 2020, Brendan Asher, who's the professor at uh, Eastern New Mexico University, Blackwater Draw, um, the Clovis site, he, uh, he wanted to track down this point and he did a full paper based on some drawings and based on some things, but he couldn't get the point. Well, turns out that a collector in Sterling, he's not, he's an avocation archeologist, he loves archeology, span but he's a collector. And he called me one day and said, you know what? I think that my great, great grandfather had this point. And he said, I wanna track this down. Anyway, it turns out this was found in 1896, okay? Um, the man was digging a ditch from the South Platte River to his field to irrigate, and he, and he found that along with these, these beads. Had it not been for the collector 100 years later plus, this would never come to light. This is a really significant archaeological discovery. And certainly, <clears throat> once, you know, once uh, the beads are cast, there are a number of universities that are already asking to be able to study that. They want to be able to study the point. They want to be able to study the beads. Think about 15,000 year old hematite beads. It's real interesting, hematite, the beads are about that big and about that big around. Uh, they're really fascinating. Hematite forms around roots. And so you get kind of natural, natural elongated pieces of hematite. And then what they did with these is they ground them and polished them and they're just beautiful. They're just amazing. And to think that somebody had that, um, it's just kind of awe-inspiring. The interesting thing, and when Eric and I talked, he said, it'd be nice if you'd kind of talk about, you know, why people collect. How many of you ever found an arrowhead? How did that feel? I mean, was that, <laughs> it is. When you pick up something that has not been touched by another human being for 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 years, the connectedness that you experience is transcendental. It is transcendental. It absolutely, I mean, for me, I almost have an out-of-body out of experience. It's just, you're like hovering over this site and you're imagining, you know, when you think about the, the indigenous folks here, they were just like you and me. They had all the same emotions. They had the same issues. I mean, they obviously didn't have some of the conveniences, but they were fully human with everything. And so, you know, when we find a, a point that was broken in manufacturing. Um, I'm just betting that when they were manufacturing that and the tip snapped off prior to them finishing it, they probably said something like you and I would when we lose when we lose a, a, a nut when we're changing a tire. They probably didn't say, oh my gracious, I wish that hadn't happened. They probably said, uh -uh. <laughs> I love the notion of that. And I love the notion of, of the fact that Oftentimes, particularly in what we call the Paleo-Indian times, which is the oldest known type points, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, they often picked the most beautiful lithic they could find. Why did they do that? You know, I don't know if any of you read, read James Mishner, but any of you read Centennial? Okay, well, you remember in Centennial, he said there's only two works of art in the Western Hemisphere, the Folsom Point and the Arch at St. Louis. Okay. <laughs> And there's something about Folsom points, and I'm gonna show a couple of Folsom points here. Uh, this is a Folsom point, and this is a Folsom point. They have a flute in them. They're somewhat similar to Clovis, but their flute is longer. They're a much thinner point. They're like the two that I showed you there from Blackwater Draw, uh, from the Folsom side. The Folsom point's beauty exceeds its functionality. Now think about that. You know, the purpose of a stone artifact was to harvest an animal, right? So why would you go to more work than you needed to? In fact, when they fluted, when they fluted artifacts, basically you take a, a, an artifact and you put a, you create a pedestal and you drive the flake off that. 
there was about a 25 to 40 percent mortality rate, meaning that they broke 25 to 40 out of 100 that they made, okay, before they got to it. Why would they do that? Why, why would you do that? Well, I don't know. I don't know. One of my good friends who passed away last year was Professor Emeritus at the University of Wyoming. His name is George Frizen. He's written more books on archaeology than any anyone I know. And he said, hey, yeah, we just call that voodoo stuff, Tom. <laughs> because he said, we don't really have the answers. But I have to speculate that when you pick the prettiest lithic and when you when the form exceeds the functionality, that there was something intrinsically spiritual about that event, that, that this meant something more to them than just crafting a point. You know, later on in time, the artifacts aren't nearly as well made. I mean, yeah, they're, they're still nice, they're still fine, but Paleo-Indians, and Paleo-Indian goes from Clovis to about 8,000 years ago. And so this, this frame that I held up here, these are all Paleo-Indian points. Uh, different different types, different styles. Clovis, Clovis, these are Folsom's. Several of you ask about this particular piece here. This is a really interesting piece. This is a, it's either travertine, which I don't think it is, or mammoth ivory, okay? And it's been drilled, and it's drilled off-centered. I believe that, that Spencer Pelton, who's a state archaeologist in Wyoming, when he took a look at it, he said, I think it's a button off of a mammoth coat. It's a toggle button. And, you know, when you think about, again, I was, we live out on the plains of eastern Colorado there at Sterling, and we've had 20 inches of snow since January 1st, which is just unheard of. And I've had to blade out my road. We live a half mile off a county road, and I've had to blade out my road four times just to get to the road. And I was thinking about, you know, I would want a mammoth coat. <laughs> I would want a mammoth coat. It had to be something warm. It had to be something... And that just humanized this particular piece for me. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, something that that just brought out the humanity. And I think for many collectors, it's that connectedness with humanity that spurs them on. You know, interestingly, um, one of the very first artifact hunters was Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> Is you, any of you know that? Thoreau was an artifact. I want to read you something that he wrote. He's kind of one of my heroes, needless to say. <clears throat> this is from his journal in 1859. I landed on two spots this afternoon, picked up a dozen arrowheads. It is one of the regular pursuits of the spring. As much as sportsmen go in pursuit of ducks and gunners of musquatch and scholars of rare books and travelers of adventures and poets of ideas and all men of money, I go in search of arrowheads when the proper season comes round again. Each one yields me a thought. I come nearer to the maker of it than if I had found his bones. It is humanity inscribed on the face of the earth. So I help myself to live worthily and lovely my life as I should. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's just, and I think, I mean, obviously in today's world, we're not saying it that nicely or that beautifully, <laughs> but I think that's one of the things that continues to inspire us that we're looking at that face of humanity. Um, now, I would be foolish to tell you that all collectors feel that same way, okay? As I mentioned before, there's a continuum. And certainly when you talk to professional archeologists, when you talk to the general public, um, there is, there's a bad element. There's truly a bad element. There are people that dig graves. There are people that collect on state and federal land. There are people that you know, have no regard uh, for, for burials. And you know, those are a scourge to us all. You know, and I, I even hate to be associated with that group of people. I mean, yes, they collect arrowheads, but the way they do it is looting, okay? Now, I tend to view looting as, you know, destroying something that has intrinsic value where it is, okay? So an archaeological context of a, of a uh, kiva or a, you know, a, a home, this shouldn't be dug except by professional archaeologists, and maybe they shouldn't be dug at all. I don't know. Our hunting, <laughs> our hunting is largely, I mean, almost exclusively, either on rivers, we hunt the South Platte River, we live on the South Platte River, or in, in wheat fields, okay? And so over the years, I've, I've tried to get archaeologists really excited about wheat fields, and they're like, yeah, we can't really get too excited about wheat fields. Well, why not? Well, because the archaeological context has been disturbed, because you find 10,000-year-old points that have been flipped up by the 
the plow and you find you know, 500 year old points have been flipped up by the plow. And so there isn't a good archeological context. Uh, I was, I was uh, talking to an archeologist one day, I was taking one of her classes and she said, she was going on how, you know, we should just leave things where they are. And I said, <clears throat> so wait a minute. I said, so you're out uh, on a field doing a sur surface survey and, and the tractor's coming up behind you with a rototiller disc you see a really nice artifact. Um, you believe we should leave it there? And she said, oh, absolutely. I said, well, probably going to get broken. She said, well, that's, I said, so you're telling me that you would leave a Folsom point? And before I got it out of my, she said, oh, well, you didn't tell me it was a Folsom point. <laughs> Everybody has their own price. <laughs> uh, I like to tell that story on her. She, she, she doesn't know that I tell it. <laughs> I think that there is something, I mean, so back in 1979, they passed what was called NAPRA, which, which was outlawed collecting on state and federal land, right? Probably a good idea. Except if you recall at the time, Jimmy Carter was our president, okay? And believe it or not, Jimmy Carter was an arrowhead hunter. And he and Rosalind loved to hunt arrowheads together. And they had a real nice collection. And he said, you know what? I'm not gonna sign this legislation unless you make an exception for an individual artifact. Because he said, we're not gonna throw Boy Scouts in jail uh, for picking up an artifact. And so, you know, here's the interesting thing, the way humans perceive things. When you were walking along the ground and you see an anomaly, it triggers something inside you, whether that's an arrowhead, whether that's a golf ball, uh, whether that's a dime, you know, something that is, is not in place in the, in the context triggers something in us and makes us want to pick it up. And so thank, thank you, Jimmy Carter, <laughs> even for all the Republicans. They have to, if you're an artifact collector, you have to thank Jimmy Carter. <laughs> he didn't do a lot right, but he got that right for sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, in, 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 when you think about collecting and you think about styles, my family and I, we, we've, we collect, we have literally hundreds of thousands of artifacts. Uh, these are some, these, this particular frame here and this particular frame here are all from our from our farm in Logan County. Uh, and they come actually from about a mile of the South Platte River. Okay, so the interesting thing about that is that we know for, you know, in how many ever years, you know, we have a Clovis point over here. Whoops, wrong frame. We have a Clovis point over here. Um, we have some other paleo, these are all paleo Indian tools and artifacts. And then over here, we actually have a couple of, somebody noticed them earlier, a couple of little trade beads that we found. So continuously for 15,000 years, people lived on my farm. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when you collect in the river, there really is no context, okay? Because as you know, the Platte River is a braided river, meaning the channel is con continually flipping. It's continually turning over. Evidence of that came to me really early when I found a Clovis Point and a Tootsie car on the same gravel bar. <laughs> it's like, oh, these were the Tootsie Clovis Indians. Yeah, I don't think so. That's not kind of how that worked. So, you know, the advantage then of collecting the way we do in the river is that it helps archaeologists then study Lithic migration, lithic is what we call stone. And it's fascinating because stone quarries at different places, okay? So there's, in, in this particular frame, uh, there's just all kinds of different stone coming from all kinds of different places. Uh, this particular stone here, there's a whole frame of it down there from uh, Oklahoma, but this is Alabates. And Alabates comes from the Red River in Texas, um, you know, seven, 800 miles away from here. It was traded up here uh, extensively. We have, uh, this, is, this is what we call flat top. Flat top's a butte that quarries over by Sterling, north of Sterling. Uh, interestingly, it was a really popular stone uh, uh, for, for literally 15,000 years. In the, have any of you been to the Cahokia Museum in East St. Louis? The, okay, so did you, just, did you get to see that burial, uh, all those points together in that, yes. Two of those are actually flat top chalcedony from Sterling, 800 miles away 
and they were using that stone. So we know, hello, so we know that they had extensive trade things. And so we can kind of look at how people were moving up and down the river, how they were, how they were doing that. Um, you might have noticed this green stone. Um, one of the fascinating things about this green stone is it's called Amazonite. Amazonite quarries down by fluorescent, okay? There's only four places in the world that Amazonite quarries. Obviously, one of them is the Amazon. Namibia, Russia, and Colorado. The Plains Indians loved Amazonite. And we find, we find this on all of our upland sites. Sometimes it's drilled uh, into a pendant. Sometimes it is, it is scored uh, so that they could use it as a tie-on bead. Sometimes they were ground. Um, there was a I don't know if you've ever been to Lake McConaughey over in Nebraska, but uh, one year it dropped really low and they were doing some archaeological surveys and they found a complete pot over there. And inside were about 500 of these little uh, stones. So they know that they were significant to that. When we collect, when we collect that way, I mean, again, you think about all this is basically within a mile, a mile and a half. We can learn a whole lot. And so what we've tried to do in our family is we've tried to make our collection available. I mentioned Amazonite for probably 15 years. I kept bugging archaeologists like, you guys ought to do it. You ought to, somebody ought to, ought to do something on, on Amazonite. This is really cool stuff. Interestingly, it hadn't really shown up in the archaeological record at all. And they didn't know that it was really an artifact. And I was like, no, it's an artifact. And it's showing up. And so finally, Dr. Jason LaBelle, who some of you probably got to hear here a while back, wonderful speaker, really good close friend, said, you know what, Tom, I'm going to take you up on that. And he sent five students out and they recorded all of our Amazonite and they recorded other pieces of Amazonite that were scored. And when they went to the Society for American Archaeology and they presented, they won the top award because nobody had ever presented this. And so when we're able to collect this stuff and then use it for scientific exploration, I mean, again, you know, um, rocks are rocks. Now, and, until they become science. And at some point in time, they become science and those became science. Now I was mentioning the fact that in our continuum, you know, we have pot hunters. We also have people that do what we call pocketbook collecting, okay? Unfortunately, the sale of artifacts is, is a big problem, you know, for, for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons that it's a problem is because it has um, created a market for what we call artifakers. And these are people who have learned to nap in the Aboriginal style. They use Aboriginal tools. And basically they're creating artifacts that strongly resemble the artifacts that were made. In fact, you know, the unethical nappers won't sign their pieces and they sell them by the thousands. If you look on eBay right now, you go on eBay and try to buy an artifact, I can almost guarantee you that 95% of them are reproductions. They will have certificates of authenticity, but they're not real. You know, and so what that's done is it's really diluted the, the archaeological record. And so again, we got, we got those people. We got the people on this side. Someplace in the middle here, however, is the ethical folks. Ethical people record their finds. You know, they know where they were found so that when an archaeologist wants to study their collection, they can tell them. Ethical people never, never dig graves. Ethical people only, in, oh, ethical collectors only engage in uh, professional archaeology excavations. Um, my wife and I have done a number of excavations with University of Kansas, University of, of Wyoming, um, the Denver Museum. <laughs> I'll tell you a really funny story. We were down at there was a site, they were trying to find the oldest Americans. And they found, they wanted to hunt the area down around Canarado. Anyone know where Canarado is? It's on the, it's on the Kansas-Colorado border, Canarado. <laughs> okay. And when they put in the interstate, because it's right on the interstate 70, when they put in the interstate, they had to rechannel Beaver Creek. When they rechanneled it, it left these cut banks. And so I had gotten permission for us to examine these cut banks. And there was about a mile of it and we were walking along and there was a mammoth femur sticking out of the side of this, uh, this wall. And so <laughs> it was about, I don't know, was it 105, am I exaggerating? It was 105. So the, the, 
this bank was sloped like this. Okay, like a triangle. So the archaeologist said, you know, Tom, why don't you and Myra excavate this? What I want you to do is I want you to start here at the bottom, go in, go in, and then up, because oh, chances are we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna get a whole mammoth here. And we don't want to disturb anything. So go so 105 degrees, three hours, we go in, we come up. Just as we get to the top, the femur falls off. It was the only bone there. It must have washed into the side of the can. <laughs> Needless to say, sometimes you eat the bear and sometimes the bear eats you. <laughs> but again, what we learn in all that is, is how to do archaeology, how to make a perfect grid. Myra is, you know, the archaeologists love her. She's, she's a perfectionist. And as a perfectionist, her grids are always flat. They're always perfect. Um, she won't even let me work with her most of the time when we excavate together. So what, what I would propose to you is that, you know, life isn't really either or. It's not, there's, there's nobody should collect. But at the same time, we need to recognize that there are people who shouldn't collect. There are people who simply violate the law, and there are plenty of laws in place to deal with them. The problem is there aren't enough, you know, there's not enough enforcement. There never will be enough enforcement to stop the illegal looting of, of artifacts. And so, you know, that gets to be a problem. One of the other things that that you know I mentioned that <clears throat> we can look at the way stone moves back and forth. Um, one of the other things that we can learn is if you look at like a site frame, and, and I, I will use. I'll use this as an example. This is a collection from Goff Creek in, in Oklahoma. And if you look at this collection, you will notice there's a Clovis point, which has been 10 to 15,000 years old. And then there's a little tri-notch point here, which is about 500 years old. So for the entire length of time, and this is about a 20 mile stretch of Creek, all of these artifacts were found representing virtually every time period. So we know, I mean, if you've been to uh, Goff Creek, if you've been to Guymon, Oklahoma lately, you might not want to spend a whole lot of time there. It's really hot and really dry. But for 15,000 years, people did all the time. And so when we look at a collection like this, we can look at, okay, so the different styles, you know, different styles tell us something. One of the ways that artifact hunters identify points is by the style, okay? You know, obviously, these are, these are the older points. These are the Paleo-Indian points. This is what we call a Jimmy Allen point, named for a site up in Wyoming. Um, and <clears throat> this is a, what we call a Hannah point. This is about 4,000 years old. This one's about 9,000 years old. Uh, this is a big knife. But one of the things when you start looking at this collection is, oh, you know, it's interesting. Most of this is Alabates. Corey's about 100 miles from here, from, from there. So that would make sense. Um, but there's a, there's a nice piece of flat top here. This is from, again, from Eastern Colorado. And one of the most fascinating things about this collection is that right here is an Amazite drilled bead. So even, even that, and so it's like, well, wow, how did that, how did an Amazite drilled bead get in Guymon, Oklahoma? And you think, well, okay, so you think about maybe it traveled down the Arkansas River and then hit the Cimarron River. And I mean, so you begin to speculate about the movement of people uh, and it gets to be, you know, really, really quite fascinating. Um, so when it comes to, when it comes to collecting, our belief is that science is important, that scientific exploration is important. Both my kids are doctors. And I suspect that the reason they went into medicine was because of their early love of archaeology, that they really, really enjoyed that. And then, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mentioned earlier that when I was, when my kids were little, their mom died and Myra joined our family sometime after that. And one of the ways that we bonded as a family was by hunting arrowheads together. And I, I will tell one story on Myra, maybe two. Uh, she, had, she grew up on a farm near Simla, Colorado, if any of you know where that is. It's uh, between Lyman and Colorado Springs. And uh, she'd never really heard about arrowheads. Um, so I explained it to her and she said, oh, okay, I'll try it. So one day we were out hunting uh, this high wheat field. A friend of mine farmed it and, and he was a really bad farmer. And it just it looked like, it looked like Sahara Desert. It was just, just blown sand. And I mean, really blown sand. 
And so we were out there and, you know, my kids been hunting from the time they were a year old. And so they were picking up rabbits. And I think we found 25 uh, between the three of us. And Myra hadn't found anything. And every time we found one, she was trying really hard to be brave. She was like, oh, I'm really happy for the kids. They really. So <clears throat> I was walking along and I saw this white one. And it's like, you can't miss a white one. So I, I saw where it was. I put down a, a, a rock about two feet away from it so I wouldn't lose it. And then I went over to her and I said, why don't you just walk with me for a while? So we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked. She went by it four times. <laughs> the fifth time she went, oh, look, there's one. I was like, oh, you finally found it. Now, the upshot of that story is that about two weeks later, she was moving the washing machine in her house. Why she didn't ask me to do it, I don't know, but she is very independent. And it bounced up on her toe and broke her toe. So about three weeks later, I said the, to the kids, I said, yeah, should we go out and hunt Ellis? She's like, they said, yeah. And uh, she said, well, I want to go. I said, what about your toe? She's like, I'll be fine. She was kind of in a boot and walking slow. From that moment on, she became the best hunter of anybody in the family. I don't know if it's because she slowed down, uh, as God was punishing the rest of it. <laughs> I don't know, but she came. The, I hunt with a group of people now, and they will tell you, Tom, I'll walk behind you because you're literally blind. I am blind in one eye. I pulled a fish hook into it, so I only have one eye. You're blind. We, we will never walk behind Myra because she never misses anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> but my point being that part of the reason we collect is because it's been a family thing. It's been a way of, of bonding in our family. It's been a way of getting my kids outside instead of playing video games. When my grandchildren come to the farm now, my oldest granddaughter, before they get the car unloaded, she will say, Grandpa, did you save me a gravel bar? And a gravel bar is where we hunt artifacts in the river. Um, and I always have. In fact, there's one little area where no one else can get into. Uh, it's real private. And so if I find an artifact there, knowing they're coming, I'll just leave it on the sand. And so then, you know, I'll walk her around until she eventually finds it. And so after one successful hunt, she called me and said, <clears throat> About two weeks later, Grandpa, you find any arrowheads lately? I said, you know, Catherine, I hunted today for eight hours and I didn't find anything. She said, huh, usually it takes me about 25 minutes. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the point being that she's developed a love of this. And all four of my grandchildren now have their own frame of artifacts. You know, they're all interested in that. They're all interested in collecting. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that many collectors have a dilemma about is what do you do with your collection when it's done? Okay. You know, sometimes people would say, well, donate it to a museum. Most museums won't take them anymore. Why? There's, they don't have any room. You know, they don't have any room. Literally, you know, this is five frames of our, six frames of our artifacts. Uh, we have 250 frames. Um, you know, again, I've collected for 60 years. And, and again, are, are most of them whole arrowheads? No. Some of them are just little chips of arrowheads and some of them are just scrapers and other kinds of tools because they all tell a story. And when you start putting these together in sight frames, you know, we, two years ago, my wife and I found a site down in Kit Carson County uh, that had just blown to smithereens. We walked out and, and one day we found 150 scrapers. And obviously we were able to know that that was what they call a dry hide processing plant. That's where they were bringing animals to be processed. And to find that many in one site was just, I mean, it was just like, here's a scraper, here's another scraper, here's another scraper. It was crazy. And so when we put that all together in a site frame then, and we say to the archeologists here, you can study this. Now they get a chance to look at that. Now they get a chance to say, oh. So in that area, these people were blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, from our perspective, the ethical dilemma isn't about collecting, it's about making sure that one, we have a good transition plan, which I do, my son, my daughter, and my four grandchildren. <laughs> my oldest granddaughter was sitting in my office one day, she was eight years old. She was sitting there and she said, I have all these artifacts. And she's good, grandpa, who gets these when you die? And then she quickly said, I, I mean, you know, when? Not, I mean, I'm not hoping for anything. <laughs> it's like, I said, you know, Catherine, here's the deal. We kind of have a deal that, when 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 grandpa and grandma die, then it's going to go to Grayson because he's the one who loves it the most of the children. And then after that, whichever grandchild likes it the most, it's going to go to them. 
She leaned back in her chair, spread her arms out and said, someday this will all be mine. <laughs> It was one of my favorite moments because because she understood, you know, um, my kid's mom was uh, eighth Indian, uh, part of the Arikara tribe, and so for my for my grandchildren, they like claiming that that Native American heritage, and in fact, my oldest, who's really most into it, um, she said to me one day, she said. She was probably six. She said, you know, Grandpa, I've been studying and reading. I need a Native American name. And I said, well, you know, you can't have a Native American name. You have to earn it. She said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, it has to be something that's just organic. It's just something. So you can't name me? I said, no, but the moment will come. So we were out around the fire pit one night on the farm, and all of a sudden the coyotes came in, and they were howling. And she started, with, what are those, Grandpa? I said, those are coyotes. She listened real intently, and all of a sudden she started mimicking. She's, oh, and they started calling back to her. And so she had this five minute dialogue with these coyotes. And I said, Catherine, your, your, your indigenous name is Sister Coyote Walking. She's like, ah. Oh. So for two years at school, she signed her papers, Sister Coyote Walking Cow. <laughs> her teachers didn't quite as understand it or appreciate it, but boy, her grandpa and grandma sure did. So, the other, the other thing that, that I wanted, wanted to talk about was this, this journey has led me to write these books. Uh, I've written seven artifact books, and these are for collectors, uh, although there are, some, you know, there are some archaeological kinds of things in it, but they talk about the romance of, of artifact hunting, about relationships, about family relationships, those sort of things. And then after that, uh, eight years ago, was it eight years ago, 2015? Uh, we had the opportunity to purchase what we call the Lithic Casting Company. And so we have what we call Mammoth Run Lithic Casting. And we make casts for um, universities and for, for collectors as well. But um, I was going to just show you some of these. These are, these are all casts. Um, and basically what they do is, this is from the site, this is from the Eden site in Wyoming. All these points were professionally excavated by Dr. Frizen and his company, um, University of Wyoming. And now we're able to make casts of these. And right now, I think this set is going to, um, is it Texas A&M or University of Texas? University of Texas. Mentioned earlier about Blackwater Draw and the Clovis points. These are Clovis points and Folsom points from Blackwater Draw. And so these are some of the most important points in North America we were able to cast these and now we can make them available. The interesting thing about that is that universities really want cast because they can't risk having their students handle you know, an artifact that is that valuable. These are right down to, I mean, many people when they cast, they just get the general, I mean, they get the cast right, but they don't do color. Myra is a perfectionist. And in fact, when we sell casts, a lot of times I will say to the owner of the artifact, it'll be there under glass with the cast and the original. If you can tell me which one it is, the original, and tell me why, I'll give you 10% off on the cost. <laughs> so far, nobody's gotten it. <laughs> um, so this casting has really taken us to a whole, you know, whole, new, whole new field. We have a lot of opportunities to meet with professional archeologists, to work with professional archeologists. Um, and again, to me, that validates what we've done as collectors because had we not started out as collectors had we not made our collections available we would have never had these opportunities so you know i think that's kind of what i wanted to to share with you i wanted to read you one more henry david thoreau quote just because again kind of my hero the name of this book stone fruit that's a henry david thoreau quote he said artifacts they are sown like a grain that is slow to germinate broadcast over the earth, like the dragon's teeth, which bore a crop of soldiers, these bear crops of philosophers and poets. And the same seed is just, a good to plant a, just as good to plant again. It is a stone fruit. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to share with you this evening. Um, and I think, Eric, you wanted to talk about questions? Oh, um, yeah, just 
Um, yeah, just a reminder to online folks that uh, we'll be taking questions through the chat. And yeah, feel free just to raise a hand and I'll let Tom uh, call on you all. Okay, great. Anybody have questions? Yes, ma'am. I toy with the variety of things, um, but a lot of furniture, powder, stains. I have a lot of earth can, yeah. can I tell it? Can I tell it? Can I tell it? Yes, you may. Uh, <clears throat> so, other things are so this is my favorite thing about about casting again. We're, we're trying to use lots of different things to make the colors perfect. Nobody cast flat top flint before because it, it always came out green but there's a lot of artifacts in our area made of flat top calcedony right it's the only thing that will make it is max factor smoke I shall. <laughs> that is the only, and now unfortunately they don't make it anymore so when my children and grandchildren see me surfing ebay looking for max factor smoke they're like, grandpa it's like no no this is business kids this is business <laughs> Yes. Yes. That's a really, really good question. Uh, so uh, if you think about the way that they were doing it, a lot of times they were driving the animals. And so like good example would be out in Eastern Colorado, there's what's called the Jones Miller site. They, they butchered 300 bison in this big arroyo. Well, the ones at the bottom, you can't get to. So you process. So if they, if they have artifacts in them, you know, you were, you were standing on the sides of the arroyo throwing darts, throwing uh, atlatl darts at them. So a lot of those points, you'd never been recovered. You'd ne not been able to recover uh, because they just were simply at the bottom of the <laughs> stack of humanity and you know if you're if you only butcher when you kill more than you butcher typically the native americans did and so you know if you're at the bottom of the pile you're probably not going to get that so that's one of the reasons the other thing is and you raised a really good point sometimes they're failed hunts now the Folsom site wasn't a failed hunt because a lot of the points were broken uh meaning that you know they hit something and there was enough of them there that they knew it wasn't a failed hunt you know again when you're butchering uh you sometimes just lose things you know you just do uh, so one of the things that I didn't mention was with the with the Paleo Indian things. They typically we think of this as a bow and arrow world. Bow and arrow is a really new phenomenon. Bow and arrow has only been around about twenty five hundred years. Prior to that, they used either spears or what they call atlatl darts. And with an atlatl dart, they would put a fore shaft on it. Okay, because if you think about particularly eastern Colorado, there's no wood out there. Okay. I mean, so your your the premium was on the shaft, not necessarily the stone. So you'd put a fore shaft on the on the on on the spear or the dart, that would lodge in the animal. The dart the the shaft then would fall away, so you could collect your shaft. So there wasn't as much premium on the stone uh, as there was on 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 the shaft. Now that said, we have found points that have been reworked and reworked and reworked and reworked, meaning that they hit something and and were unsuccessful. But a lot of the ones that are are found in carcasses uh, were probably just accidentally left there. Good, but good, good question. Yes. Um, so before I uh, before I give this question, um, can you sit there and um, repeat the question if you get a chance? That will <laughs> help the uh, online folks. Of course. Um, know what the question was. I'm also putting it in the chat. Um, what is the difference between a close point and a fulsome point? Um, so I think folks weren't able to see the, the display case okay. super clear. Sure. So uh, Clovis points are older than, than, than Folsom points. Clovis points, interestingly, Clovis technology, when it came to the new world, it lasted maybe 500 to 700 years. And every state except Hawaii, there had been found Clovis points. So they spread out in 500 years all over North America. Folsom points are later iteration. They are, they are you know, maybe 12,000 years old, maybe 12,500 years old. 
And they both are fluted, although the Folsom point is fluted much more extensively, oftentimes, you know, to the tip. And when I say fluted, I mean, they drove a channel out of that to aid in hafting. Basically, they would put their, here, here's your point, they would put the foreshaft into that groove, and that way they had better hafting uh, in terms of sticking to the thing. So basically, the difference is the age and the size. Typically, Folsom points are more diminutive. Clovis points are more robust. Uh, of the, there's a lot of different theories. Um, you know, one of one of my theories, and <laughs> so it may be just me, but if you're if you're basically some of the first people in the new world, and you're just kind of going around, wandering around, you know, I mean, you don't know where you're going, you're just going, you're following the rivers, you're following the, the creeks. One of the things that you need is a defensive weapon. Okay. And so in my in my vision, not only did you have your 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 throwing stick and your your darts, you also carried a spear with you. And a lot of Clovis points are very big and robust. Interestingly, and this is something that archaeologists haven't haven't come up with yet. Uh, several avocation archaeologists and I are working on this. We have found Clovis points, big ones, with polish on the tip. Now, why would it have polish on the tip? Well. Imagine that you're walking across the sand hills and you stop to take a drink or whatever you do. What are you going to do with that spear? You're going to stick it in the ground. And right where that would have been stuck in the ground, and there's a little polish, like it had smoothed it out. Now, we don't have enough in the archaeological record. I think so far we've identified three. So they could just be anomalies, but it's a kind of a cool thought. Again, it humanizes me because I carry a walking stick. And when I get tired, I stick it in the sand. <laughs> And I think probably that's what they were doing as well. Any other questions? Yes. Are you collecting these from the ground or are you digging? No, we don't dig at all. We don't dig at all. These are all surface found artifacts. Yeah, no, and, and I'm sorry I didn't make that real clear. I don't believe in digging. Uh, I don't believe in disturbing sites that haven't been disturbed yet. We're hunting an agricultural disturbed ground uh, and the river. And the river, as I mentioned earlier, just tumbles everything. And so, you know, we don't we don't dig at all. Um, yeah, so you record where you, where you found it? We do. Take it somewhere to give us uh, food? No, so, so oh, I mean, again, I've been studying this uh, for many, many years. And so I know how to do that now. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, you again, we, we look at point types. So if you look... If you look this this particular frame over here, um, this starts at about 7,200 years ago and goes clear to metal arrowheads, which are obviously historic contact. And so this is the these are different point types, and these point types then were discovered in archaeological context and were able to be dated. So then we're able to take we're able to look at a point like this and say, oh, that resembles that point that was found in Wyoming which is 6,500 years old and called a Hawken point. And so the archeological community has adopted certain names for certain point types based on the stratigraphy that they were found in in, in archeological context. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, that's okay. If there's something here, they... I thought this gentleman had a question. Okay, all right. Where, oh, let's see, let me back up. Um, what kind of written record do you keep for what you collect? And how do you label the casts so it is clear that it's a cast? Uh, okay, so so the, 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 let me answer the second one first. If you pick up a cast in an artifact, you can tell the difference immediately because the casts are plastic. And so they don't weigh as much. So, you know, they're, I mean, <clears throat> and I, there wouldn't be any benefit in trying to pass one off as the other, uh, other than just for fun uh, to tease somebody, but we don't really do that either. So, uh, and what the first question was, how do we record? So <clears throat> I, have a, I have different ways of recording. Um, basically, we take a photograph of, of the point and then that, that's entered into a log, that photograph of that, whatever we found that day, we put the site that it was found in and then record that on the date that it was found. And so we have photographs of all the points that we have found 
and we put those in a database. Other questions and comments? So just a couple, yeah. I'm just curious, as part of the location, you use GPS coordinates now? So really good question. Uh, we have sometimes, sometimes. Uh, you know, the, like in the river, the context is such that, you know, something may have moved. I had a friend who did an experiment on the Kansas River. He threw in uh, 15 flakes of flint with his phone number on it. And, and uh, please call if you find this. And 15 years later, he had a person call uh, and they had found the, the particular flake three miles from the bridge. Okay, so during that 15 years, it had traveled three miles. I don't know how far stuff travels. So the GPS coordinates are probably less important in the, in the river. On the fields, basically we do it by section, you know, so, so it's kind of that way. Um, when, when, like in 2001, my son discovered a Folsom site over near Myra's farm in Elbert County. And there, when we recorded that uh, with the archeologists, we did it by GPS. So we know exactly and plot it out. Other questions? Yes. Do you have any idea how many things you have found over your lifetime? <laughs> you know, I, my mentor, I mentioned him earlier, Bert Mountain, and I would always say, and Bert had an entire basement full of artifacts, and I would say, Bert, how many points do you have? And he'd say, two good ones and three pretty good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, no, I don't. I mean, I mean, probably. Our, our family, we're closing in on 100,000 artifacts. Uh, again, it's, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, two years ago in Eastern Colorado, we had a bad drought, okay? We still kind of have a drought, but right now we have 20 inches of snow. So two years ago, we had a really bad drought. And when they planted their wheat in the fall, they had to plant it in dust. And then we had a 70 mile an hour wind. And basically it blew the fences closed. I mean, it blew dirt up over the fences. And, and so it was horrible. That year we found 650 arrowheads. Yeah. And that didn't count the tools. There was probably another 1500 or 1800 tools. So, you know, it's, it's and again, when you have, when you have, you know, like when my grandkids come out and we'll have six people hunting and it's not unusual to find, you know, on a good day, 30 or 40 artifacts on a bad day, you might not find any. And this year, you know, probably because the wheat has this beautiful blanket of snow and all my wheat farmer friends are so happy. We probably aren't going to find any arrowheads this year. <laughs> and that's okay because the farmers deserve a crop. You know, I, I, we, we farm too. We have some alfalfa and we have some corn. And so I'm always glad when we get moisture, kind of. A <laughs> um, couple things. Yeah. Got another one? Oh, I think just yeah, one more from someone. Oh. Where do you store 250 frames and how do you mount the artifacts? So, so uh, 100 and 100, uh, 80, 80, 85 to 100 frames are in Alaska with my son. So one of the things that happens is we collect by site, meaning that every artifact from a site gets put in a frame, okay? Uh, if we lose access to that site, either because the land turned over you know, and the new landowner doesn't want us hunting there, or uh, it's been put back in CRP, which is grass and we can't hunt it anymore. I will send all those frames to Alaska because my son, even though he's a doctor, mostly he just likes archaeology. <laughs> and then he studies them and studies them and writes papers on them and does that kind of stuff. So, so basically the way we frame them is this type of frame right here. This is pressure mounted. Um, you know, this is a composite frame. Right? This isn't a site frame. I just put these together because I wanted to show you some Paleo Indian artifacts tonight. But these other two, this, this frame over here is this is a this is a site frame. This is all from our farm. That one over there is all from our farm. This is a site frame all from one 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 creek. Now there are about 10 other 10 other frames. This just happens to be the best stuff uh, from that site. Keep the frames together oh, where do I keep? Well, keep some of them in Alaska and I don't know. My office is getting. <laughs> uh, did, any, did any of you ever travel down I-70 and th there was the Tower Museum? Did any of you ever go to the Tower Museum? Oh, well, there was this guy by the name of Jerry Chubbuck and he collected everything. And it was just when you walked in, it looked like chaos. My son, last time he was home, he said, 
dead, your office is beginning to look like what he called Chewbacca land. <laughs> because it's just stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks. But the nice thing about it is they're all right there. Uh, when we go out of town, we put the more valuable artifacts. I didn't really mention mention value because to me, the value is not the uh, the dollar value, but there is a huge value in these as well. Right now, these artifacts you're looking at are probably about three hundred thousand dollars worth of artifacts is what you're looking at today. You know, I mean, again, not 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 that we'd ever sell as Myra says they're not worth anything because we'd never sell an artifact. It's kind of like selling your children. Although I've thought about that, I've never thought about <laughs> selling an artifact, <laughs> and I couldn't find the gypsies when I wanted to give them away. So, uh, any other? Yes. It's a personal one, although I'm participating in the Projectile Point project in Colorado. And I say that with a heavy sigh because the way they're doing it is really hard for me because they want both sides and they want everything black lighted, UV lighted, so we can tell the stone. But I'm, an, I'm a lithic expert, so I can tell you the stone. In fact, I can put a piece of stone in my mouth and about tell you what the what type it is. So yes, we're part of that we're part of that project. Uh, so eventually, we'll try to have most of that in there, uh, so that there is a public database. Um, so it, it, this is really interesting, um, and thank you for bringing that because I forgot this piece. So as I mentioned earlier about the river, about hunting the river, there's no really context, right? The Division of Wildlife bought up about sixty to seventy miles. Of the South Platte River, okay? So you can't hunt it anymore, right? So, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when we started hunting, we could float any place. And as long as we had permission from the private landowners, which nobody cared, we could pretty much float from Denver to Nebraska. Now, because the state owns all that ground, we can't hunt on those grounds. So guess who is hunting it? The people who are doing it for money, you know? Uh, and, you know, if you're a meth user, Man, hunting arrowheads is a great way to support your habit. Uh, I know a kid who made over $40,000 one summer, just hunted arrowheads while well, he didn't care. And he got got arrested, got a $1,000 fine. He said, just, I'll write it off on my taxes. It's just the price of doing business. So I went to the state archaeologist and I said this. I said, here's the issue. We have people that are illegally hunting this and they're selling these and we're losing the archaeological record. Even though there's no context, there's still the record. I said, so here's what I would propose. Let's do what we call an isolated river fine, meaning that you purchase a license, just like you do for elk or deer or anything, $250 a year, so the state makes a little money. And then every time we find an artifact in a state wildlife area, again, just on the river, not, not, in, public, not in public land, just on, just on the river, we take a picture of it, we send it to the state archeologist. Over the course of the summer, they would develop a really nice database. Needless to say, they've not gotten back. <laughs> but if you have any influence with the state archaeologist, you, know, you might mention that, hey, I heard a really good idea. You guys could increase your information. Yes. I can't? Well, so. So, yeah, so I mean, take a picture. So at the end of the day, we come home, we lay them all out on a piece of felt, take a picture of that. And if there are three or four sites we hunted, we divide them by sites. And then I put that in, the, in, in my record and say, this is where we hunted. And I've gone through a number of different logs. I used to write on the back of them, the numbers, but that got a bit tedious. So with technology now, all you have to do is take a picture and record that picture. Yeah. And then, a lot of times I'll print them out too. I'll print out the picture. I don't just leave it in the. Uh, I've started doing that recently, just taking a picture of the artifacts and then putting that in my log with the stuff as well. Yes. Have you ever found something when you were out that like you had reservations about keeping or that you thought like I need to call in um, like an archaeology team or maybe an indigenous community would be interested in this or something like that? Um, <clears throat> the. Longer answer is no. The shorter answer is, you know, uh, we have turned over a number of sites to archaeologists over the years. Um, Myra found a Clovis site down in Kit Carson County, 
that we turned over to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and they came out and did field work there for two years. We found a Folsom site. We, we contacted the archaeologists. Again, if we find something that has real archaeological significance, we're not going to hunt it. We're just we're going to record it and then turn it over to the archaeologists. Most again, most of what we find is in disturbed contexts. It's in wheat fields. It's in the river. Nobody really cares. Uh, you know, it's like they they care because I mean they care in terms of you know this is good stuff for us to look at. It's good stuff for us to record. It's good stuff for us to study. Last summer we had twenty five CSU students come out for a day and spend time learning about collection, learning about the, the collector community and how we operate. It was very successful. They all felt pretty good about it. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. We were hunting the Rickery River and about there was a bank about, oh, as high as that? Right at the very bottom was a bone bed. It was like, oh my gosh, we just found the mother load. So I marked it on the GPS, called Jason LaBelle, CSU. I said, hey, I think I really found something here. Got permission from this guy. You guys can... Turned out they were 50-year-old cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> now, how 50-year-old cowboys got at the bottom of the 10-foot wall made me realize the deposition that happens during flooding, okay? Because uh, the flood, I mean, now they'd be 80-year-old cowboys, but... Nonetheless, they were cow bones and I was devastated because I was just sure that I had found the next bison kill site. But um, if we ever found skeletal remains, uh, we would call, obviously, first you have to call the coroner or the county sheriff. That's, that's, that's the law. So if we found like something like that, we would contact the, them and then they would contact whomever. Uh, so our, that would be the end of our involvement with that. Yes? Do you collect clock shards too, or pottery? So, you know, they, they, <laughs> we don't really have much pottery out on the Eastern Plains. I mean, if you get them, they're about the size of your fingernail. Uh, so yeah, we, we pick those up because again, they have archeological significance. Um, we have, we have a, a 40 acre ruins over near Cortez uh, that has never been, well, I shouldn't say that before we got it, somebody pot hunted part of it. I've asked Crow Canyon to come in and, and take a look at that because I think it would be something they would be really interested in. They have yet to, to say whether they'll do that or not. In the meantime, we're just, you know, we're just making sure nobody else pot hunts it. So, yes? If you've got a database, you know exactly how many artifacts you have. Right? Well, yes and no. Yeah, I mean, because sometimes they're not done by numbers. They're done by, you know, this frame, this frame. So I could count them all, uh, but... I've tried that. I've tried. I've tried to get my granddaughter to count for me. I was gonna. I paid her. She's like, "Well, I got to six thousand and I quit." And so, <laughs> I don't blame you. I can't count that high. Um, yes. One more question from the online side: Have any archaeologists ever started out as collectors? <laughs> <laughs> Most of them did. Most of them did. Most of them. You know, we're, we're collectors. Certainly many of my friends that are archaeologists started out as collectors. Um, and then at some point in time, they, de they decided to get more scientific about it. And they went to school and they got their doctorates in archaeology. And so as a professional archaeologist, you're not allowed to own a collection. You know, you make sure that it's donated uh, to, to the appropriate source. Uh, but many of them started. I mean, very few people had no interest in wonderlust about artifacts and all of a sudden became an archaeologist. You know, you just weren't going to do that. Yes. Can you explain it what the collection would be for? Like if you said museums are mostly full, so who would pay that? Just another collector or, or yeah, museums museums don't purchase artifacts and neither do universities. But let me give you an example. Uh, very good question. So a friend of mine is a rancher over in Kansas, and he found a Clovis biface cache. And this is one of the bifaces. This is a cast, okay? He found 80. 80 of these blades, some of them were this big. And so he had, he curated that for a number of years. Um, he called me about two years ago and said, you know, would you be willing to appraise this for me? He said, I want to donate it to CSU. And so we went through a big process and I do some appraisal for, for uh, estates. And so we were able to appraise that collection for them. And then they got the tax write off, you know, a portion of that. And they donated this entire collection of, of Clovis biphases to CSU and Dr. LaBelle has done a wonderful job 
of really studying and really being getting, getting into it. Nice thing about it is now we have we have these permanently in the archaeological record to be studied for the next hundred years. Yeah. Uh, so so again, he had space for this particular because this is such a unique assemblage. You know, I mean, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you know, the fat, I mean, for every whole artifact I have, I have 25 broken ones and scrapers. And so most times universities, museums, they kind of eschew that kind of stuff. They're like, eh. you know, if you've seen one broken woodland point, you've maybe seen 10,000. <laughs> so there isn't a whole lot of value there. But for the collector community, I mean, yeah, for the collector community, they want to, you know, they want a high end. I mean, there are people that, that want to spend a lot of money and purchase artifacts. The problem is every time an artifact changes hands, it loses some of its archaeological value. Not, not dollar value, because it may go up, but archaeological value. So I try to, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of people who, tr who want to donate their collections. I just did a, I just did a big collection for uh, University of Wyoming. Uh, that's being donated to uh, part of it goes to the University of Wyoming, part of it to the Sunrise uh, Red Red Ochre Museum there in, in uh, Sunrise, Wyoming. Again, it's, my goal is to get stuff in the public record. Why would it lose value? So, so because you never know. I mean, like, if you go on eBay right now, you'll see everybody. Yuma County was kind of the hotbed of archaeology for in the twenties and thirties and forties. So you'll see all these points on eBay found in Yuma County. Well, that gives it more value, right? Because it was found in Yuma County, but it wasn't found in Yuma County. It's changed hands 17 different times. But if you put Yuma County on it, you're going to get 10% more for the point. Um, you know, what's that black building again? The black Obsidian? Obsidian, yes. Um, do you know if you hunt in the Midwest? Like, you know, so I hunt Colorado. just Eastern Colorado, just mostly... The Nebraska Panhandle in eastern Colorado, uh, yeah, pretty much from from Fort Morgan to the state line, down to I seventy, maybe a little bit farther than I seventy, and then a little bit into Nebraska. Yeah, I'm surprised there's not more obsidian. So when you get farther south, uh, uh, when you get farther south, uh, there is more. When you get down Springfield area, there's more. When you get up into Wyoming, there's a little bit more. We I didn't bring any obsidian today. We've probably found. I don't know, 30 or 40 I'm sitting in the points over the years. I love that. I mean, California, Oregon, right. just full of it. Yeah. I've heard that, you know, really a hard stone. It's, it's a, really valued. Yeah, no, it was. It, it was one of the best lithics they could have. In fact, um, I had a, a student from CU come out and do high. You can you can actually tell the source of, of, of obsidian by doing a hydration study on it. And so they found, they had 20 pieces of obsidian that they tested. Most of it was from New Mexico, okay? Uh, but the coolest piece was from the Snake River in Idaho. And it's like, wow, found it right behind my house. And it was from the Snake River in Idaho, 1,100 miles away. So that kind of made me happy. It's like, ooh, that's a, that, that told me something that somebody, that piece of stone traveled a ways. So, yeah. You have mentioned working with archaeologists. Are most archaeologists willing to work with collectors? So this is a really loaded question. Uh, <laughs> so I was I was online today. I post a, a a Facebook page called Best of the High Plains Artifacts, and we have a number of professional archaeologists on there. And somebody I told I actually posted that we were doing this talk tonight. And posted the topic, and everybody said, "Oh, you're in trouble. You're going to get blasted." And it's like, eh, "I'm pretty winsome. I don't think so." Uh, but they said, "You know, this person was very disparaging of archaeologists." And what I said was, "You know, it depends. I mean, for example, all of the Western archaeologists, you know, uh, Wyoming, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, all those people understand, you know, kind of the value of collecting, and so they 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 aren't pure." Uh, as the driven snow in terms of, I would never, but I have had an archaeologist tell me he would never look at an artifact that was found by a uh, by a collector. It's like, well, it's kind of like cutting off your nose to spite your face. I mean, because, you know, again, more artifacts are going to be found by people who are looking for them than by people who aren't. <laughs> There's your gem of wisdom for the night. <laughs> uh, just a couple things to close. There's a, 
we brought uh, plastic casts here. If any of you would like a token of this, uh, you're welcome to take a plastic cast. And I do have some books available if anybody's interested in a book. So I appreciate the opportunity to share with you this evening. Thank you all very, very much. And uh, safe journeys home.